I have a recurrent image in my mind of a man leaning in and locking eyes with another whilst he lights a cigarette. It's an image repeated constantly throughout cinema, a reinscription of a gesture enacted famously in Jean Genet's Enchantement, a single man, pink narcissus, happy together, amidst others. In Compton Mackenzie's 1913 novel, Sinister Street, a young man is approached by what might be called an esthete. Won't you smoke? These cayenne cigarettes in their diaphanous paper of Maldus Mauve would suit your oddly remote, your curiously shy glance. The afterimage of a man lighting another's cigarette is a repeated gesture acted out and instantiated that echoes through time. It has, been a, it has become a recurrent code in which desire can be expressed or relayed. It is legible and benign, coherent yet disappearing in a puff of smoke. It's a performed language repeated enough times that it becomes an inscribed choreography, an apparition reoccurring in the projected image pinpointing the moment in which one man wishes to test the orientations and predispositions of another. It is a salient gesture and a form of communication. It is also something that is not there, that is barely present but by a fleeting glance, a hand lingering too long and eyes that seek contact gently moving over another. In cinema and literature, this repeated gesture constantly reenacted over and over becomes a point of identification, a threshold, a slight action repeated to, as Carolyn Dinshaw describes, enact relations and retrace past sexualities in all their heterogeneity to extend the resources for self and community building. Some of us identify with the hand, the cigarette, the mouth. Perhaps passe now, given present attitudes towards smoking, this gesture and act is a way of repeating and reinscribing in the present a queer approach to constituting a lineage. The act itself is not necessarily queer, and those depicted enacting it are primarily homosexual men or representations of homosexual men that do not necessarily constitute queer bodies. It is the act itself, the repetition of a sleight of hand reproduced so consistently that it becomes a legible, illegible language that we on the inside of this queer perspective recognize. It's an act of a secret being exchanged in plain sight, a gesture that begins to stretch across time in which modes of fantasy and longing are being communicated and recognized by those that view them. I may be accused of, and often feel as though I am, reading into this gesture. This apparent reading into, the attempt to extract something that is barely perceptible, but nevertheless present, present is often accompanied by a type of guilt. The guilt is a self-interred feeling derived from a latent art historical homophobia, a homogenizing field that aims to debunk attempts at framing the contextual, condition, the contextual conditions of someone's sexuality as an implicit facet of an embodied approach to being in practice. Dominant art history mars queer interpretations of sexuality and practice as a critical faux pas, an analytical misfire. But this reading into is necessitated by what has been omitted, yet covertly disclosed, restrained or written out, yet latently waiting to be rediscovered and given shape in the present. It is maybe there, but also maybe not there, and that is okay. After all, history is a construct of perspective. A lineage itself is a peculiar notion to ascribe to a queer mode of practice, for both its inference of a line and the way a lineage is generally predicated on the formation of genealogical tracks, primarily based on reproduction. To form a queer lineage is not to reenact the homogenizing force of forms of repronormativity, but to ensure that there are models and thought practices on how this might be possible. The act of constructing a queer lineage in this instance is not a matter of revising bodies and placing them under the banner of queer, but perhaps queerness is primarily a methodology that in my practice acts to critique the epistemological underpinning of disciplines such as historiography. Yet it is also more than this, not a reactive agent against the status quo. For me, it derives from a deeply felt bodily sensation, response to materials, thoughts, and practices. The drive or desire to connect with the past or construct a lineage is something that someone like Elizabeth Freeman might consider to be a sexual engagement with the leaky and libidinal potential of, what, of that which has preceded. What has occurred does not firmly remain in the instance of its occurrence, but it reappears in peculiar and spectral ways. Perhaps history becomes a site of projection and fantasy in which, in which one can extrapolate various notions to aid in reifying and consolidating facets of the self, social space, social groups, and methods for approaching relationships, practices, and family 
This lineage, it must be noted, is not singular, but plural. And to engage with this notion is not to pathologize a practice, to deem it as a symptom of the self, but it's a reflection of how this aspect of self is expressed and per perhaps present as a facet, a fragment of experience that inflects what we do. An art practice and materialist approach to historiography becomes a way, like the gesture of a hand lighting a cigarette, enacted again and again to form and consider certain aspects of a historical relationality. It can become a way in which to express elements of self, sensibility, and identification across and through time, processes deeply bound and felt within one's body. Within the smoke one draws in, my mouth becomes somebody else's mouth or somebody else's gaze. In 2016, my partner and I had been together for a few years. It was a period in which one was confronted with unknown terrain, and I found myself considering the future orientation and shape of a queer relationship. As the tracks and actions of my family were firmly placed in a Perth working class hetero partner plus house plus marriage plus dog and then baby and usually divorce, this genealogical repetition seemed like a well-rehearsed structure for living that had barely diverged from the generations that had preceded. I had little in the way of a model in which to think through or work off the playing out of a queer approach to coupledom. In a very lateral way, this self-analysis coincided with elements of some theory I was reading at the time, which exacerbated a desire and yearning to connect to and consider, consider lineages of gay men and how one can touch and get to know these through an artistic practice. Not one to place myself center stage in my artwork, this process became an elliptical way in which pieces of literature and material explorations of historical content allowed one to find a grounding within aspects of my predilections in life. In 1954, the play Kenneth Koch, A Tragedy, by Frank O'Hara and Larry Rivers, describes a scene in which Jackson Pollock walks into a bar and refers to Larry and Frank as those fags. Whilst many gay men were active vanguard artists at the time, John Cage, Rauschenberg, Johns, Merce Cunningham, Andy Warhol, Cy Twombly, their homosexuality is something often remarkably omitted until recently from both biographical accounts and the language in which we read and position their practices. A conspicuous omission of particular note is the six-year relationship between Jasper Johns and Rauschenberg during the 50s. In a rare reflection on this period, in an interview with Paul Taylor, Rauschenberg describes the six-year relationship he had with Johns as a period in which they gave each other permission. For some reason, the term lingered, as I initially asked myself, what does permission entail in the context of this remark from Rauschenberg? Was it permission to engage in romantic and sexual activities with someone of the same gender in a climate whereby it was illegal and taboo? Or was Rauschenberg referring to the leaps each made in their work throughout this period in regards to moving away from the then cumbersome ubiquity of abstract expressionism? Or could it pertain to the way in which they collaborated on window displays, commissions by Jean Moore for Bonwit Teller and Tiffany's under the pseudonym of Matson Jones Custom Display? What is integral to the notion of permission is how the relationship between the two men created a space that allowed for the enactment of activities that otherwise, due to social and cultural conditions, were inadmissible. Johnson Rauschenberg confronted intense homophobia at the time, and this is something that also acted to cut off not only their relationship from their public life, but elements of their careers from the development of their artistic profile. Throughout the time of their relationship, the two men worked on a series of window displays. These were a really refer rarely referenced in relation to their artistic practices, despite material correlations and certain practical crossovers. The window displays were generated by the couple under the pseudonym, as said, Matt Mattson Jones custom display. As the only works created by the two men together, they become, in a way, evidence of their relationship tableaus that reflect on two men working together in love and life. The namelessness of the displays describes the revived masculinist attitudes of a post-war society that demeans certain industries and the men and women that work for them, positioning them as inferior, fey and effete. They also float over into the art world, whereby the preferred autonomy and romantic domination of nature through art pervaded, acting to valorize figures such as Pollock. These displays thus reflect social divisions as many queer men and women employed in these industries were routinely and still are positioned on a hierarchy of what qualifies and what doesn't. This dynamic can be attributed to many things, 
but it can certainly, at least in part, be traced around patriarchal attitudes that dictated what was suppressed and what wasn't. Despite the two men maintaining this commercial practice in a relatively secret and covert way, they to aid each other in their development. They supported and were in turn supported by other gay men and women in these commercial ventures, which became for a time the financial scaffold that supported their practices. These windows of bejeweled webs, melancholic still lives and crystal encrusted pomegranates are vignettes of their relationship. The notion of permission had gripped me, in part due to its romantic underpinnings and the inference of a shift from public recognition to a hermetic public of two that grant each other agency through their mutual acceptance to create window displays, make the art that they wanted and to express themselves sexually. How can or, or if permission become a form of trans-historical relationality? Can we look through these practices to extrapolate on what they lend to the present in terms of communities? Does this notion of permission extend to our current capacity to enact certain gestures in the present, having paved the way for a relative openness in discussions surrounding elements of queer modes of being? Does the notion of permission reflect a way of thinking about how a relationship aids and abets from within, rather than externally relying on historically constructed and constituted voices to legitimate ways of living and practice? Permission became the basis for a series of prints, permissibility, whereby the archival imagery formed the ground in which one can reflect on this gay history, and through acts of repeating and reinscribing, assert its potential imprint on the present. These images, through a form of analog UV exposure printing, come about through a temporal process, whereby a felt bodily approach to the material articulates agency in the act of historical research. Coloring, feeling history's edges and lines whilst maintaining a connection to the past. This touching of material, historical, distant, a kind of vapor, like the hand leaning in to light the cigarette, performatively retraces certain steps and gestures, as facets of the past are made manifest as impressions upon and made manifest as history and literature begins to take on a weight, grounding these quickly dissipating moments. Impressions upon and folded into our knowledge of what forms of love and being can be drawn out from the residue of the past. <laughs>